Awesome. Okay, so now we're back for our second panel of the morning. Uh, it's about innovative techniques. I'm um, just going to read the bios of the uh, three panelists uh, before we get going. So Christy uh, Legali is a senior scientist for the Good Food Institute, a nonprofit organization working with scientists, investors, and entrepreneurs to advance food innovation. As a mechanical engineer, Christy has worked on diverse projects including space and ground-based telescopes, natural gas engines, roller coasters, and commercial aircraft. Uh, she joined the Good Food Institute from Boeing, where she worked as a mechanical engineer and technical project manager on the 777 and 777X programs. Uh, Rosie Wardle is a program director at the Jeremy Collar Foundation, a strategic grant-making organization based in London. Uh, in this role, Rosie recently launched the Farm Animal uh, Investment Risk and Return, or FAIR, initiative. Uh, Rosie also acts as an advisor for Collar's investments in the food technology space. Uh, currently working towards a PhD in linguistics uh, and the discourse of animal production. Uh, Rosie holds a BA and an MA from the University of Oxford and an MA from the uh, Courtauld Institute. Uh, finally, Catherine uh, Herman is a veterinarian specializing in animal welfare science, ethics, and law while working at the Animals and Science uh, Inspectorate in Berlin. She's finishing her PhD at uh, Dalham Research School for the Biomedical Sciences at the Free University of Berlin. Uh, she's a diplomat of the European College of Animal Welfare and Behavioral Medicine, a founding member of Minding Animals Germany, and is currently editing a book on the ethics of animal experimentation. Uh, please welcome our panelists. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, again, my name is Christy Legali. I'm a senior scientist for the Good Food Institute, and we'll be talking about uh, food innovation and um, the potential in food innovation and all of the opportunities um, there, therein. So the Good Food Institute is essentially founded on the principles of effective altruism, the idea that we can address uh, issues of global poverty, climate change, human health, and uh, animal welfare by addressing uh, advances in food innovation. I mean, we are a donor-supported uh, nonprofit organization that uses the market and technology to find alternatives to um, animal agriculture. So I, what I want to talk to you about today are all of the opportunities for food innovation. I'm going to talk briefly about cultured or otherwise known as clean dairy and eggs, and then clean meat, which is also called cultured meat. Um, let's talk a little bit about what the industry looks like for cultured meat or clean meat, and then the innovation and opportunities in that space. Pardon me. Also, to, on the same note, talk about plant-based meat, all of the innovation opportunities there, what the industry looks like and where we can grow that area, as well as talking about meat as, uh, meat as ingredients, and then to talk about the complementary efforts uh, for food innovation. So for those of you who aren't um, intimately familiar with making a dairy or making eggs without animals, it is very possible to make the proteins involved in milk by modifying yeast and growing the yeast into um, growing yeast and then extracting proteins from those yeast that are essentially identical to the proteins in milk. The same kind of thing can be done with, dairy, uh, with egg proteins. This is actually a picture of David Anschel at Clara Food, the company that is making egg proteins in yeast, growing that yeast, extracting the proteins, and essentially making uh, biological identical egg whites without the use of animals. So on a similar note, uh, this is actually the process for making clean meat, um, not with yeast, but actually with the actual cells that do come from a, a harmless biopsy from, from an animal. Essentially, you start with a starter culture. You, um, need to grow up a number of cells in order to uh, have enough cells to start to work with. Uh, that those cells are transferred, oops, pardon me, cells are transferred into a tissue bioreactor where the cells are put onto a scaffold, some sort of porous material where the cells can grow into essentially a piece of meat. And the end product is essentially the is very similar or almost identical to meat. Um, these are actually design projects from some design students working in food innovation. Um, this is an actual sausage by a, a pig that's still happy and healthy and running around the yard. And this is a, 
uh, oysters of a meat besides just oysters. It's, it's just kind of, kind of this idea that you can make meat uh, into whatever form or shape you want. So I'm going to talk about the industry mind map for clean meat. This is essentially our uh, theoretical view of the white space and how we can fill it with um, alternatives to support, or pardon me, the, the innovations required for clean meat. Um, first, as I mentioned, it starts with starter cell lines. There are lots of opportunities for entrepreneurs, companies to create cell lines of all types of animals, whether it be fish, chicken, pig, you could even do, you know, a frog or whatever. Um, and essentially to support uh, meat, meat, culturing meat or clean meat. Um, then media is essentially the commodity item. It's the food that pr is provided to the cells so they can grow up and to grow into meat. Um, the structure or product is that scaffolding. It's the idea that um, essentially the cells can grow into a piece of meat if they have the support of a scaffold. Usually it's a biodegradable scaffold, but this is also a great area of innovation where a lot of people can, you know, add to the industry and, and get involved in food innovation. And finally, bioreactors are essentially where all of this comes together, where the cells are grown and uh, the scaffold is seeded and this, the tissue, the cells become tissue. And as you can see, there's just enormous number of, of opportunities for people to get involved regardless of your, your um, background. Um, there's so many business opportunities, so many research opportunities and innovation opportunities to um, affect the overall industry of clean meat. Finally, one of the things that will be very interesting when clean meat really starts to come to fruition is that we'll, there'll be differences in supply chain, and so even people with backgrounds in uh, business or marketing will have opportunities to participate in the clean meat economy. Uh, just to give you some real-life innovations that are already occurring, this is actually for clean meat, support of clean meat. This is actually a discovery platform that we anticipate will be used for clean meat. Um, essentially, it's a robotic platform to determine how, the best, how to grow the best cells or how to feed them with different types of media. And it's essentially, we're hoping to use it to, uh, we're hoping some researchers will use it for uh, streamlining efforts towards uh, optimizing the process for clean meat. This is actually a bioreactor that's already for sale on the market, easily could be used for clean meat for the proliferation stage that I spoke of earlier. This is actually a cell imaging tool that is um, available on the market now to do quality control for clean meat. Same type of thing here. Um, this is actually a scaffold that has actually been designed specifically for clean meat. It's made of a common food additive called titanium dioxide. If you've eaten Daya cheese, you've eaten Daya uh, titanium dioxide. And these people at the Fraunhofer Institute have figured out a way to grow cells on it to start making pieces of meat that are a little bit larger. This is actually a bioreactor that can actually change the nature of different cells so that you end up getting fat cells as well as muscle cells in the meat you're going to grow. And this is actually just a picture of media. A lot of people are concerned that serum is going to be required for clean meat, but it turns out there are lots of cell lines that actually already have animal-free media available to them. We just have to ask those companies to make the same type of media for the cell lines that we want for animal agriculture. So lots of opportunities, but there's also lots of opportunities just to apply that are already happening that are applied to clean meat. So same type of thing for plant-based meat. Uh, plant-based meat is, is a huge field. I think it's one of the uh, most promising fields for replacing uh, meat in, in our, uh, in our um, in our society. Essentially, there are a couple ways to do that. Um, we can talk about making products that are similar to meat. Um, I think most of us are pretty familiar with uh, products like Gardein and Tofurky. These are high quality plant-based meats that really do serve to replace meat without people giving up anything. But there are other options for replacing meat, such as uh, meat that is not similar to meat, or replacements that are not similar, things like mushrooms or sea tan. Um, one of the great examples is field roast that always claims we're not trying to taste like meat, we were trying to make something better than meat. So we might as well, right? <laughs> might as well find something that's even more enjoyable. Also, there are functional meats. You know, so many meats, and I'll talk about this more, so many meats are actually ingredients in other products, so it's important to um, find opportunities where Given what we have today, we can instantly replace it in consumer products. So um, it's, a, it's a good area of replacing meat. And finally, 
center of the plate options, such as um, replacing meat without something that's supposed to be like meat, or that may be culturally appropriate, and really, uh, you know, bringing those forward as consumer products, or um, you know, just highlighting them as good opportunities for alternatives. Falafel, jackfruit, mushrooms, pulses, things like that are, are good examples. But in terms of getting involved in food innovation, in terms of, it, of applying your skills to food innovation, one of the areas that is really important to think about is meat production. How is plant-based meat made? It turns out there are lots of opportunities in this area. There are patents going back to the early 1800s for mechanisms and, and uh, methods of making plant-based meat that are better than, you know, that could be potentially better, and some of them are better. And some of them provide us more opportunity for making more plant-based meat so that we're actually uh, replacing, uh, making it available for people overall. Especially for if, if you've ever been in an area like I live, <laughs> we actually have uh, not enough plant-based meat in, in the areas where I live. It actually gets sold out quite often. So meat production is a big area that I, I enjoy talking about. But also, there are a lot of opportunities for research and development in plant-based meat, especially along the lines of quality control, sensors, um, and understanding how plant-based meat is made and how we can make it better. Um, so this is another area that if you're if you have a, a science or engineering background, this is a good way to get involved in food innovation. And finally, and certainly not least, plant-based protein and uh, farming is certainly the where all of this starts. There are new opportunities for isolation of proteins, for uh, pl protein exploration, new types of protein, new types of plants that can make plant-based meat. And so this is a great opportunity for, um, even if, if you don't have a background in science, to just start exploring these incredible opportunities. So um, I encourage you to, to look into some of these if you're interested in food innovation. I want to give you some real life examples. This is actually a, a new type of um, manufacturing method for plant-based meat. It's called the Couette cell. It essentially makes very thick, highly fibrous, as you can see here, plant-based meat. And um, it's a new method that is different than a um, more common extrusion method of plant-based meat. Um, some other, some other uh, ways that we are looking at trying to uh, increase the amount of plant-based meat is looking at distribution and looking at all the opportunities we, can to, we have to increase distribution of, of the current plant-based meat and make, allow and open up more markets for that. We're also helping entrepreneurs find opportunities for doing research and development, like taking pulses and making them into plant-based meat. This is actually an R&D center that's open to entrepreneurs and small businesses and large businesses. There are, this is a little bit hard to work out in your head here, but this is actually an extrusion center to make um, plant-based meat or actually other extrusion products as well. But um, that's a, that's a, there are about three of these I wouldn't say three in the world, but at least three locally. Well, Canada, France, and, um, and Florida, the ones that, that we know of so far that are available for entrepreneurs to make use of to make new and different plant-based meats. And finally, one of the things a Good Food Institute does is to help um, address opportunities in research and development. This is actually a picture of a twin screw, a twin screw extruder, and this researcher in um, in Germany is actually looking at stress profiles and how the plant-based meat is made in such a machine. And he's looking at opportunities for making it better so that um, you, know, you have less failure of batches, you can do more throughput, things like that. So there's really great opportunities in all of these areas for entrepreneurs, business people to get involved in food innovation and really advance how, much plant, how many plant-based meats are out there and how much is out there. Finally, I want to just talk briefly about replacing meat as ingredients. There are great opportunities for providing high quality meat opportunities or meat, meat in packaged, um, for packaged goods for consumer, uh, for consumer convenience. Um, you can get just some examples here beyond meat, just per replacing something like lean cuisine or tofurkey, replacing something like bon appetit. But there are actually large food service companies that can um, provide. Uh, extruded meat for, you know, production of uh, prepackaged foods for institutions, schools, hospitals. 
And finally, I just want to reiterate that um, there are a really complementary efforts that are required for food innovation. And at the Good Food Institute, we really address, try to address all of these areas, including startup support, mentoring entrepreneurs, connecting with co-founders, and working on policy issues, trying to level the playing field for plant-based meat and eventually for clean meat when it comes out on the market. Also, we work on social media presence, outreach, and even entrepreneur-focused groups to help connect entrepreneurs and find each other and, and stay connected about new ideas. We provide leadership on areas, things like the industry mind maps that we provided here, and policy advice and industrial industry evaluation so we can all understand where the possibilities are. We also work on directing research funds towards plant-based and clean opportunities as well as helping students find opportunities in the field where they might best, might best find their, uh, their, their niche in this, uh, in this field. And we also work with venture capitals, capitalists and cap capital <coughs> firms to evaluate proposals, to um, provide guidance on investment opportunities, particularly when they're working in a new space. So if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can contact me at the Good Food Institute. We have a variety of professionals who are working in all of the areas that I just discussed, and I'd be happy to take, uh, you know, answer your questions. Just email me in at your convenience. <laughs> Thank you. Right, thanks everyone, it's great to be here. Um, so just to recap, my name is Rosie Wardle, I'm the Programme Director of the Jeremy Collar Foundation, which is a charitable foundation based in London. Um, today I'm going to talk about our work with investors through our initiative, the FAIR Initiative, which stands for Farm Animal Investment Risk and Return. Um, and I'm going to explore the role of investors as agents of change within the animal movement and how we're using research to engage with them. And I'm glad that some of you in the last kind of session brought up some questions on the financing of the industry, because that's exactly what we're working on here. Um, so just to give you some background briefly on us, our main strategic focus as a foundation is on ending factory farming. Um, we set up this program in 2013 when I joined the foundation. Um, as an organization, we were founded by Jeremy Collar, obviously, who is an investor who's made his money through his firm, Collar Capital, which is an international private equity firm, and they're currently managing um, $23 billion. Um, Jeremy is personally very passionate about animal rights, and he decided, essentially, three years ago, that he wanted to use his wealth to help end factory farming, as it is the largest cause of animal suffering today, which we've been hearing a lot about this weekend. Um, so we originally envisioned ourselves as um, a grant-making foundation, supporting other organizations doing good work in the space, and we still do that, but we quite quickly realized that given Jeremy's background as an investor, um, we were uniquely positioned to use that status as an insider to influence the investment community um, and to harness the power of investors as an agent of change, um, and that's what we're doing. So, um, why investors? Um, why are they relevant and how do they fit into this mix of effective techniques which we've been hearing about this weekend? Well, in my opinion, they're a crucial actor in the food system alongside companies, consumers and policymakers. Um, I mean, especially in the current political climate and the events of this week, we obviously can't rely on governments to be moving the food system in a more sustainable direction. And we need to be engaging with all the other stakeholders, and investors are a very important one. Um, most importantly, investors obviously are kind of the owners of the agribusiness companies and the livestock companies that we're essentially talking about here. And so they've got massive potential to exert big in influence on the food system. Companies are ultimately accountable to them. Um, so it's kind of like a way of doing corporate engagement using investors and it's this kind of technique hasn't been properly utilized in the movement so far, we didn't think. 
Um, so all of that, I guess, is kind of obvious, but the more tricky part is then how do you start engaging investors on this issue? Um, of course, investors aren't going to start acting on factory farming or any other animal issue out of the goodness of their own heart. At the end of the day, they're about making money and their focus is on their fiduciary duty, making the best possible returns for their clients. Um, so the basis of our work with investors is using a rising trend within the investment community. And this trend is called ESG, stands for Environment, Social and Governance. Um, you can see examples of the issues which the E, S and G cover on this slide. Um, so in sim very simple terms, this is a way for investors to look at how sustainable their investments are um, and how sustainable the companies that they're investing in are. Um, and over the past decade, the idea of ESG has become a mainstream, essentially, within the investment community. And over that time, we've seen the growth of responsible investment from being a very niche area of investing, which only really specialised ethical funds um, took part in. And they did things like screening out industries such as arms and munitions, tobacco, um, gambling, so-called sin stocks. Um, so it's changed from that towards ESG being a kind of screen which all investors apply to at least some extent within their investment processes. And the reason for that is at its core because investors are starting to realise that these issues are material. They will have an impact on their returns in the long term and the short term as well. Um, we're seeing this increasingly with things like climate change, resource use, animal welfare. Um, so they're starting to see them as risks. And you've only got to look to, like one example in the animal movement would be the Blackfish film, which once it came out and went viral, had a massive impact on SeaWorld and the stocks dropped by 50% and they still haven't really recovered from that. So investors are starting to see the risks. And this is backed up by um, various pieces of research from well-known financial institutions over the past couple of years. Um, most recently, a study by Barclays Bank showed that introducing these ESG factors into the investment process resulted in a performance benefit on the um, investors. Um, and just to illustrate this, the UN Principles for Responsible Investment, it's called, which is kind of a global hub for investors looking at ESG and responsible investing, um, has had $60 trillion signed up since it was founded t a decade ago, and that's three quarters of the world's investable capital. So you can see the movement. Um, so essentially, we decided to start this initiative called FAIR to look at how the factory farming industry fits into this investment climate um, and how the industry is impacted by the E, S, and G issues, which I showed on the previous <laughs> slide. And um, Everyone in this room knows, I'm sure, that it cuts across many of those issues. So just to give you some background, formatting's gone a bit funny on that, but never mind. Um, FAIR is a collaborative investor network. We say it's by investors, for investors. Um, we publish research on the materiality of factory farming for investors, and we provide tools for investors to assess the issues within their investment processes. Um, and once we've done that piece of raising awareness and provide the tools for investors to understand it, we also coordinate collaborative engagements with companies on specific risk areas. Um, so that's essentially trying to mobilise the investors to engage with the companies to improve practices. Um, so just to make clear, we only launched this in December, so it's still early days for us and we're still kind of thinking through our strategy going forwards. Um, but since the launch, we already have had more than a trillion dollars of investors signing the network, which we've been very pleased with. And this is just an example of some of the investors that we've had sign up so far. And um, I've been pleased with the mix of kind of larger institutional investors to the more um, the smaller sustainable green funds and the very geographically spread as well, which is great. Um, so as an example of the research we're producing, this is the first report that we released when we launched the, um, we launched the network in December. So it's this, I've got some copies if anyone would like to look in any more detail. Um, but this is essentially a report which is a very broad look at the factory farming industry, identifying all the potential financial risk areas that are linked to the industry. 
and we commissioned um, Veris Maplecroft, which are a well-known um, risk analysis firm, to do this. Um, so essentially the report finds that there's 28 material issues connected to the industry. It found that there's a strong business case for considering factory farming issues as part of investment decision-making process. Um, and it also so showed that um, these issues can affect the financial performance of companies all across the food value chain, although the, um, in the most cases the actual producers, so the direct companies that are involved in factory farming, were the most exposed. Um, and it found that the industry is highly vulnerable to long-term environmental and regulatory trends, which is kind of obvious, I guess. Um, so this is just a um, graphic representation of the risks that we've, we've found. And obviously, I don't have time to go in loads of detail about these, but you can take one of the reports if you want to have a look. Um, but it crosses E, S, and G. Um, so we've been really pleased with the reaction that we've had to this so far. Um, we kind of, before we launched, we were wondering whether investors would take it seriously, but luckily it's not a hard case to make that this is a risk. Um, we've been pleased with the reaction of the investment community and of the more mainstream um, media as well. There's so much interest in this. And this is just an example of some of the coverage that we got after we launched um, the report, which we were very pleased with. Um, so on the basis of this initial report, we have started coordinating these collaborative engagements with investors, which um, I think is where this has the potential to have real impact on the industry. Um, so I'll talk a bit about that now. So our first engagement, which we launched in April, is on antibiotic resistance. And this is one of the risk areas that we identified in the report. Um, we decided to start with this issue because it's obviously a very high profile human health risk and investors were already aware of it and kind of wanting to do something about it but they didn't know what. Um, so although I would never do a sole engagement on this, we always look at it um, amongst other issues. It was a good kind of gateway issue to get investors to start thinking about the broader risks connected with the industry. Um, so this engagement currently is targeting 10 of the largest global restaurants and fast food companies, which I think they're all on there, um, addressing the excessive use of antibiotics in livestock production. And we've got 60 investors signed on to this engagement with one and a half trillion dollars of assets under management. Um, so the ask of this is essentially um, that the company should be phasing out routine use of antibiotics. It shouldn't be used as a prop for the factory farming system. Antibiotics should only be used um, to treat disease where it's present. Um, and obviously that amount of investors is a very big statement to the companies and to the broader um, like media and everything that this is a real issue and investors care. Um, so that was launched in April. The current status is we're in direct dialogue with eight of the companies. Two of them are being very resistant, so we're exploring some other techniques to get them to um, actually engage directly with us. But the ones we are engaging with, they're very open to actually working with us um, on new policies, which has been great, and some of them have already given concrete public commitments. Um, so we're kind of in dialogue with these companies alongside the investors at the moment. <coughs> And so the second engagement, which is the one I'm most excited about, and I'm sure many people will agree, is on um, sustainable protein, we call it. So we launched this one very recently in September. Um, and this is essentially engaging with these 16 international food companies. We chose um, retailers and some of the big multinationals like Unilever and Mondelez. Um, and with this engagement, we are essentially looking at all the risks that we identified in this report. Um, and there's a strong focus on the climate aspect of this. Um, we were using research by Chatham House and other organizations who have essentially identified that without addressing livestock production, there's no chance of us globally reaching the two degree limit, which has now been set out by the Paris Agreement, um, which um, obviously is going to be a risk to the industry because as, com as countries start looking at their sector-specific emissions and targets, the livestock industry is going to be impacted. 
So there's a lot of risk there that we're highlighting in this engagement. And we're also looking at the opportunities presented by the growing market for plant-based proteins. So it's kind of a nice balance of risk um, and opportunities. So we're essentially the investor group, which is 40 institutional investors with 1.25 trillion assets, um, uh, asking these companies, what is your strategy to address this and how are you diversifying into more plant-based protein <coughs> sources of protein to address this risk and exploit the opportunity? And we've got a briefing on this, which I've also got copies of, if anyone wants, which goes into more detail on the investment case of why we need to be looking at protein supply chains and moving towards more plant-based proteins in order to um, build resilient supply chains. Um, okay. And we haven't got any initial results from this engagement yet because it only was launched in September and the deadline for the companies to reply is the end of November. Um, but we had some great reaction from the media and lots of high profile press coverage when we launched it, which is a good sign and also another push for the companies to engage with us proactively. So we'll be doing an update on how that engagement is going probably at the start of December once we've got those replies in. And then the kind of final thread that's in the mix at the moment here um, is something that Christy covered extremely well in her presentation, so I won't go into massive detail, but we're also looking at the impact investing side in food technology. And whenever we speak to investors, um, we talk about the food technology revolution, which is happening, and basically raise awareness of this, which I'm sure everyone here knows very well, um, that there's lots of innovations happening in this space and investors need to be aware of it. Um, there's a lot of investor interest in this and I mean at the moment a lot of the companies are, um, like these, these are ones that we're personally, Jeremy's investing in and we're kind of hoping that these impact investments will foster the development of this animal free economy. Um, but these obviously will go on to become mainstream investment opportunities for the institutional investors that we're engaging with. And so we're kind of socializing investors to that um, at the moment. Um, so, yes, um, that's pretty much an overview of what we've been doing so far. It's kind of just the start of our work on this issue. So we only launched in December. Um, we're building our strategy for the next couple of years at the moment. Um, we really want to bring more research to this issue um, to establish the materiality and build on this report that we released in December. Um, I want to focus on the climate aspect as well um, and do more research on that. And we're really keen to build um, partnerships with academics and organisations in this space. So if any of you have got any ideas or um, want to talk to me about that, then please do come and find me. Um, and we want to also grow the current engagements that we're doing. So I'd like to, for example, expand the sustainable protein ones, look at food service. Um, there's lots of different ways we could um, expand those engagements and also look at additional issue areas, like including a focused engagement on animal welfare, on things like labor rights, resource use. There's so much we could do, so we're prioritizing at the moment. And we're growing our team, so if anyone's interested, then talk to me. And yeah, that's it, pretty much. Um, you can see more on both our websites or feel free to send me an email. Thank you. Thank you very much to our panelists. We have a few, uh, few minutes for a Q&A. Um, OK, not everyone at once, wow. Uh, yeah, that's good. Hi, ladies. My name is Nzinga. I wanted to thank all three of you for being here. My question is for you, Christy. Oh, okay. There seems to be a lot of misunderstanding about the biopsy process. I, I guess I wanted to know, one, what is the process? And two, what would you say to a vegan who thought that the biopsy itself is exploitation on its own? So um, that's a great question, and I'm just going to admit right off the bat that I am not the right person to answer that question, but um, I know someone in the room who is. If you talk to Marie Gibbons, um, she's working on, um, there she is, way at the back, being forced to raise her hand. 
Um, and, um, but, you know, so the question of a biopsy, as honestly Marie has just explained to me, because my background is in technology, not biology, um, but I appreciate the question. Um, essentially, what Maria has just shared with me is that really it's just a sesame seed seed um, biopsy from an animal. And um, while it does obviously require animals, um, it's, it's, we think it's a very minor intrusion on their um, uh, you know, freedom, especially if it can be done in some other procedure, you know, having a dental or something. <laughs> I'm just guessing. Um, at any rate, uh, the other interesting thing about clean meat is that um, there's a lot of effort towards finding um, clean meat, um, making clean meat cell lines so that that biopsy really only ever has to happen once, and then the cells can be used indefinitely if they can be immortalized or if for some reason they are somewhat naturally immortal, meaning that they can use to be scaled up. And um, again, Marie is the, the right person to talk about just how many, how much meat can be made from a small sesame size uh, seed of a biopsy and it, it will pretty much blow your mind but I won't speak mm -hmm. on her behalf <laughs> Great. Um, so I have two questions one for Rosie and one for Christy um, so my question for Rosie is um, it seems like a lot of the investors in your network right now are think like organizations interested in climate um, initiatives. Like right now, there were a lot of climate investor groups, for instance, and the primary like example you cite is of a climate um, like project. So I was wondering if you think the reaction to this might be to focus on reducing, for instance, like beef and like cheese and like lamb, which uh, seem to have higher impacts on climate change, and whether you think the reaction might be to substitute towards more fish, for instance, or more leaner meats, and like your thoughts on that, um, since we're here and we're concerned about animal suffering, whether or not that could actually like have negative effects in that regards. My question for Christy is, so like one perception, intuition that I have had, and I'm not sure whether this is correct, so please feel free to kind of disconfirm that if I'm wrong, um, is that there seem to be more kind of uh, red meat and like chicken substitutes uh, within the meat replacement industry and less like fish substitutes for instance. And so I'm wondering whether that perception is A correct and B like what are the kind of barriers? Why don't we have more fish replacements? Is there something structurally different about fish? Um, is the market not receptive for that kind of thing? Like yeah, no, that's a great question and it's definitely something that we're very aware of and have thought a lot about. Um, to be honest, like you said, a lot of the investors we're engaging with were already thinking about climate and we're kind of moving them towards looking at livestock and agriculture. Um, and of course that is a potential danger, but I think that's another reason why it's important that FAIR exists as a network because we have a very specific mission focus, although when we're talking to investors we don't necessarily like put that front and center and we our research is very independent and unbiased but we're kind of there to shape the narrative in a way and we always focus on looking at the plant-based solutions because i mean um as bruce at the goods food institute always says very well like hands down plant-based is obviously much better than even the most efficient form of animal product um whether it's chicken or fish so we're kind of controlling the narrative which i think and um, to answer your question about um, the perception that there is a lot less fish out there, um, it is an area that I also believe is neglected in terms of plant-based um, alternatives. It's actually not the only one that I think is neglected. You know, ham is another area, and um, there are a number of other meat products that um, we really don't have um, substantial or volume replacements for. Um, there obviously is a difference in manufacturing between you know, getting something that is really flaky versus something that is stringy. Um, and there's oftentimes you know, people who have, or companies that have actually breached that, you know, those areas, um, that information is proprietary, exactly how they did it. Um, but we, we have been looking at a number of patents over the last 100 years or so that do show um, a considerably in, very interesting opportunities for creating fish 
Um, and we're hoping to, to launch some projects in the near future, hopefully at a university, to um, really evaluate what the opportunities are for making um, plant-based fish. Um, because I, I agree, I think there's an enormous um, opportunity to replace that and, um, and have really high quality products that would be very acceptable to, to much, of, much of the world. Hi, thank you so much. I absolutely loved this panel. I have worked on animal experimentation issues for my whole career, so I absolutely echo everything you said, Catherine, and would love to see the EA community talk more about the use of animals in labs and all the problems that come about with that. But my question is actually for Rosie. Um, so I have been working and learning more about how food companies are potentially going to be engaging with animal testing for safety testing as well as hypothesis-based testing, primarily in the clean product space. Do you think if investors learned about this that there would be, you know, I don't know, I guess I'm wondering how ethically motivated the investors are to this issue because we're going to be seeing this, this problem with FDA as well as this, the, the like blue skies research that will be happening in the food space. So animals are going to be impacted in both ways. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's not something we've looked at yet, to be honest. I'd like to talk to you more about that because it'd be great to get your insights. Um, I mean, to be honest, most investors aren't ethically motivated, and that's the whole framing of FAIR is that it's about the materiality of the issue rather than the morality. But obviously there's um, places where those two intersect when you're talking about reputational risk to companies, for example, due to consumer awareness about certain practices, and that could possibly come into play in the case that you're talking about. So perhaps we can talk about it a bit more later. Okay, I think that's uh, about uh, all the time we have. Thank you very much, everyone, for the engaging questions, and thank you to our panelists. <laughs>